Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the AIM webinar series. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Mary Lou Bosco, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at AIM. AIM is the premier industry association for the automatic identification market. For nearly 50 years, companies have joined AIM to lead the growth of our industry. AIM serves as, as a hub for quality resources covering all types of barcode, RFID, NFC, Internet of Things, and mobile computing information. AIM delivers trusted resources that connect you to new customers and business partners. I would like to direct your attention to your monitor to review a few housekeeping items before we begin our presentation. First, the attendee phone lines are muted um, during the course of the webinar. Um, we do not use the raise hand option during the webinar presentation. However, you may ask questions um, by using your chat option at the top of your screen and chat with AIM Inc., who is the host. And you can submit your questions throughout the course of the presentation, but we will have a, a Q&A session at the end. Without further ado, AIM would like to thank Avery Dennison for their support of today's event. Our speakers today are Jeannie Duckett, Manager, Printing and Research Development, and George Deich, Director, RFID Product Management, Retail, Branding, and Information Solutions. Please join me in welcoming Jeannie and George. Thank you, Mary Lou. All right. Thank you, everyone. This is George Deich, and uh, glad to have you on the call. Uh, my background is about 20 years in the wireless industry, probably spent about 12 years of that so far in RFID industry. So uh, between Jeannie and I, we have a lot of information that we're going to cover here. Uh, the slide deck will be available um, shortly after the uh, webinar. Uh, but our intent here is to give you a really good broad overview of the various RFID technologies. And Jeannie, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Jeannie Duckett. I'm in charge of technology development and printer research here at Avery Dennison. And for about the last 15 years, I've been involved in RFID and implementation of RFID in uh, thermal barcode printers. Okay, great, thanks. So the, the topics for today is really just to cover the basics. And what I'm going to do initially is go through some of the very fundamental basic stuff around automatic identification, data capture, the different types of RFID and how they work. And then I'll hand it over to Jeannie, and she'll get into more of the, the technology and the applications of, uh, of RFID. So when you think about what is automatic identification and data capture, if you just look at the words themselves, I mean, it's really around automatically, so it's not using a, a mechanical pen or paper uh, pencil, but automatically capturing data that there's an object that you're identifying, that you're automatically capturing that information or that data. And that data is what turns into information that you can then take you know, business action on. So the technologies we're going to talk about will really be around how we automatically capture and collect that information. And some examples of, of ways of capturing data, I mean, you see these in your everyday life of the products that you purchase when you're, you know, when you're shopping online. Uh, any, take your computer, for example, and turn it over, and you'll see barcodes with uh, you know, information on there. So, for example, you have 1D barcodes, which are very common. Uh, there are 2D barcodes that are typically used uh, using vision systems or cameras to read that. Uh, very commonly used are magnetic stripes that you see uh, on your credit cards, and then RFID technology. And, and why would you want to use automatic uh, identification technology? Uh, when, when you think about you know, just writing things down with a pen and paper pad, uh, how they used to be many, many years ago, you know, it, it, it's very difficult sometimes to identify what, did I, what exactly did I write. Was that a 5? Was that an S? Uh, was that a V or a Z? Did I hear that person correctly in what they said? So the, the manual writing has become, you know, a, a, a source of error. For example, if you're keying errors into a terminal, you have a 1 in 300 chance of an error. And if you took a, a typical uh, barcode class, you know, from GS1 or, or universities, you know, the, the, the probability of error using manual techniques is very high, whereas when you get into barcode, it becomes one in the three million type error rate. And with RFID technology, it, it becomes one in 10 million and even, in, in, in even lower than that. And 
Auto identification data capture is a very broad term. So it's not limited to a single technology, but it's really around a family of technologies. And you can break it down into a couple categories, one being printed or encoded. And what we're showing on this slide are just some of the common ways that you've seen uh, things printed around you know, different types of barcode. And those different types of barcode usually will have you know, a certain amount of information that you can store in it. So as barcodes were once simple, they become more complex because you're still using that technology to add more, more information on there, which moves into a 2D barcode in, in the various types. And, and it's really interesting because when you look at your credit card, you have stamped information on the card, and then the magnetic stripe was a way of extracting that information to capture it. And now more recently, we have you know, the, the microchip that's EVC added to it, EVC chip that's another way of capturing the data. Or you have your credit card stored into your phone. So those are just examples of how automatically capturing that information from, from your credit card in this example has evolved. So we're going to talk a little bit more about RFID technology and really you know, what is RFID and fundamentally it just what it stands for, radio frequency identification. It's about the, the, the uh, transfer of information between a tag and a reader uh, where the tag is usually carrying the identifier or some information and the reader is a method of extracting and that, that information from, from the tag. And, our, and, and, and here we're showing uh, you know, different applications or examples of how you might use RFID. And RFID is not a new technology. It's been around since 1940s in, in World War II. And we, we've seen a lot of um, growth in that technology over the last you know, five to ten years. And if you think back to 2000, early 2000 time frame, there's some you know, strong leaders in, in, in the industry around you know, Depar Depar Department of Defense, Walmart, uh, p and and those companies were, were, were very much looking at that technology to see how they could use that to um, improve their supply chains. And the thing about RFID is it's, it's fast and it's reliable and it, it's really you know, non-line of sight, meaning you don't have to visibly see the tag. It can be embedded, it can be you know, in, in the area which you want to you capture and be able to read that. Now within RFID, there's three types of technologies uh, or subcategories you could think of. One is active RFID, there's semi-passive, and there's passive. And with active RFID, active RFID tags typically have a battery power source. Um, it's sending its ID to a reader. And, and these type of devices you would see as a common application for container tracking, where containers are large, you're in a very large uh, geographic, uh, you know, space and you need long range of the, from that tag to be able to transmit data to a, a reader. Uh, they typically have a lifespan because of the battery. Uh, they, they're more complex. They, they, they tend to be a higher cost type of RFID technology. When you move into an, the other type, which is semi-passive, uh, semi-passive uh, means there is a battery present, but the battery serves a different function. So number one, uh, the battery is typically maybe collecting data, you know, sensor data or information in the environment. So sensor tags, for example, uh, would be using that battery to collect information, and we'll, we'll show an example of that later in the presentation. Uh, they're smaller, they're lightweight, uh, they, they, they're used as data loggers that you want to maybe capture that data later at a certain time. And the passive component, the RFID, is where you're extracting that information out of the device. Okay. And then the third type, which is the lower cost of the three options, which is passive RFID, uh, where simply the, the, the components of that passive RFID is really around just a, a simple chip and an antenna, where the, the tag will operate based on the energy it receives from the reader. So a reader device, when it illuminates an RFID tag, the tag will power up, and once it powers up, it's able to establish communication with the reader so you can extract that information, that data. And, and the reader, is, again, is supplying the, the energy to the tag. And a lot of the common applications for it, uh, item level apparel is, is a huge application. So if you go into your, your favorite uh, apparel store, you'll very commonly see the RFID tag in the price ticket. You'll see it on poly bags of uh, uh, the apparel items. 
if you, if you travel through McCarran Airport or Hong Kong, check your luggage, uh, you will see that there's RFID. So, there's, so the, the passive RFID enables uh, tagging the, at the item level in a low-cost manner um, with, with a wide range of types of applications. And when we look at passive RFID, there's even subclasses of that. Uh, I would look at it as LF, which is low frequency, um, HF, high frequency, UHF, ultra high frequency, but we'll commonly refer to that now as RAIN. So you'll hear RAIN RFID is what the industry uh, is talking about. Um, and then you have this microwave frequency, which is higher. And the, 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 the main thing here we wanted to show is the low frequency, these, these all have applications. So one is not better than the other. It really just depends on what is the application, what are you trying to accomplish, what is your job to be done that you want to achieve identifying that item and being able to capture that information um, easily and, and seamlessly. And what we're going to talk about here in this presentation, the bulk of it will be on the HF, NFC, and RAIN RFID. And we want to show here just a couple of things to call out. Number one, the, the use near metal or liquid. Uh, the lower frequency and high frequency devices tend to work better near, near these types of items, liquid and, and metal, where UHF as a frequency band tends to be more uh, challenged by those types of, of materials. So if it's a human body, race timing, or you know, close to the human body, or, or meats, for example, that becomes very challenging. There are, there are tags on the market that are specifically designed for on metal use, so although we show that you know, RAIN RFID tags are, are challenged with by metal and liquid. There are specialized tags that, that can overcome that. So let's talk about some of the characteristics of the, the HF RFID. So the, the HF frequency band operates at 13.56 megahertz. Um, it uses a magnetic coupling. So typically, what does that mean? Magnetic coupling means you're in closer proximity to the, uh, to the reader. Uh, it's not a signal that's propagating in space at great distances, so it tends to be more localized, more concentrated. You can think of the gates as you walk in and out of a, a, a store or in a library. Those are examples of, of, of HF. Uh, the interesting thing is that the types of chips for the HF uh, products tend to have a lot more memory. So you'll, you'll find what common characteristic is these things are, are higher memory, they have a lot of uh, file storage, um, and it's just one of the common common characteristics of that. And, and what we're showing here are just the different types of uh, interface standards. And the two most common that you're going to hear in the industry is ISO 14443, which is for secure payments and you know those types of applications. Very good for privacy. Those type of uh, devices have a lot more encryption uh, capability. Um, you know, for secure access. So think about, when you hear 14443, you can think of, you know, secure access control payments. Um, ISO 15693 is, is, I don't want to say it's not as secure, but it's a very common standard that you'll see in the library space in many applications. And, and those are for, you know, ticketing, for, you know, some access control, uh, for some, you know, library uh, tracking and, and uh, you know, bookshops, for example. And, and the third one is not a common one, Jeannie, but I think it's more, it's a type, the type of protocol where it allows very close proximity of the tags. So the examples we're giving here would be if you're, ta you're tagging documents or, or poker chips at a casino, you need something that can operate in that type of environment. So you have a lot of options with HF. Within HF, there are a lot of options and a lot of standards that you can, um, that you have at your disposal depending on what kind of uh, job you're trying to accomplish. Switching gears to uh, RAIN RFID, which UHF, uh, it's a frequency band, so it operates in the 900 megahertz. Uh, so common advantages of uh, this type of passive uh, technology is that uh, long read ranges uh, for a rather low cost type of device compared to an HF alternative. You've got really good performance in terms of the data trans back and forth between the tag and the reader, high density applications. So when you, when you think about item level, uh, Internet of Things at, at the item level, RAIN RFID will be a big, I think, a big center stage in terms of the technology used 
for that, that type of application space, and we're seeing that grow more and more. As we mentioned previously, just some of the common disadvantages is that different types of materials will impede the performance of the tag, but there are techniques and ways of overcoming that. So it, it, it's, it's really, um, we, we just want to hit, hit, hit the point here that, that it, it, it's a very versatile uh, frequency band, very versatile technology, and it's something that you're going to see in, in more and more applications. Now, on the air interface standards, one of the things, years ago, what, 2005, Jeannie? It was the Gen 2. The Gen 2, the Gen 2 protocol, which really is just the air interface. So many of you think of, think of Wi-Fi. I mean, Wi-Fi, you're not thinking of what, gee, what is that air interface? How does it work? You just know what Wi-Fi does. Wi-Fi connects your mobile devices to an access point to therefore, um, you know, get connectivity to the Internet. Well, the air interface, I mean, you're going to hear RAIN RFID, so it, it's just a way of saying, you know, we, we have a, a interoperable air interface so that these RAIN RFID technologies can, can operate seamlessly, um, whether, you know, depending on what type of reader device you use, what type of tags you use, as long as the, the readers and the tags and the chips are, are, are RAIN RFID, i.e. Gen 2 compliant, though that, that just really speaks to the interoperability. Um, and there's an ISO standard that was ratified many years ago, so again, there's, there's a standard that, that was established for this, this protocol. And, and this is a little bit of an eye chart, so I, I'd ask, if I could see everyone, I would ask you to raise your hand and ask me who could point out the uh, UHF frequency band for the uh, FCC here in, in the U.S. What we want to just point here is a lot of these technologies operate at very specific frequency bands that are allocated by, uh, by, by, by the region and by the various countries. Uh, so with, with UHF, it's very specifically in, in the U.S., it's from 902 to 928 megahertz. Um, in Europe, it's, at, it's about 869 megahertz. So, I'll, so what we want to just point out here is that the type of reader devices that are used for that technology will typically be certified for that frequency band for that specific country over there. Now this is a, a generic kind of high level view of what, what's a passive RFID system. And, and let me just work from left to right and, and describe what we have here. Uh, typically you're, you have a business problem or business need that you're going to want to you know, have some kind of business process established for the items that you want to tag. And that application might sit on a, a reader um, a device with, with the reader antenna. That middleware app, business application, reader antenna, those three elements could be standalone. So if you have a, a portal with antennas where products moving in and out, and you have a, a, an application running on there, that could be one example. If you have a handheld device which has the app reader built in and the antenna all in one, that's an example of what's on the left-hand side. An RFID printer where uh, you have a reader and antenna inside where it's encoding. So it's very, meant to be very generic, although we show the, these different components. You, you can think about it as, I have an application, a reader, and antenna. And the purpose of that is to send out an, an RF signal to energize the tags in the field. Now the environment piece is pretty, pretty open. And what I mean by that is, if you're in a printer trying to communicate to a tag, the environment for a printer is very different than if you walk through a doorway, than if you were trying to read tags in, in a pharmaceutical environment where it's very high density. That's kind of what the environment means. Like, what does that tagged item look like? What, what is the environment that it's in? And how, because remember, you're, you're sending a signal into that environment and then you have to extract out to be able to hear and listen to that tag respond back. And obviously you have the tag on the product and the tag to product is an interaction that's very interesting. So when you look on the market, you're going to see a lot of RFID tags that have different geometric shapes and they're different sizes. And the whole point of that is you're typically limited to, or you, you choose to have a size of the tag or label that you're putting on the product because of maybe the packaging real estate. And then the antenna shape itself is meant to compensate for the material to be able to do two things. Number one, receive energy from the the reader, but then also to backscatter it, its signal to the, uh, the reader itself. Okay. And so there's an interaction between the tag and the product? Yes. And the interaction between the tag and the product is more about the detuning effect. So right. 
So, it's, so you're looking at op maximizing and optimizing the tag for that type of material. And you may have situations where the tagged item is in very close proximity stacked next to each other. So think of little small vials in a little um, tray. In a tray where there could be hundreds of them in very close proximity versus maybe a hanging uh, ski jacket where the tag is maybe two or three inches from the neighboring tag, which is a different environment than the small vials. Thank you, Jeannie. Uh, just what, what makes up a passive uh, UHF, or excuse me, RAIN RFID inlay, it's very fundamental. You have an antenna, you have a microchip, and you have a carrier. Uh, what we're showing here is an example of a antenna shape. Uh, you'll typically see aluminum as the material uh, of the antenna material that's on the market. There are uses of, of copper potentially, but predominantly you're going to see aluminum. Uh, you get really good UHF uh, range performance uh, with these tags, and then you have the uh, RAIN RFID chip that is is the uh, brains behind it, if you will. And and the whole point here is that you. You design the antenna to do two things. One, you, you match it to this, the, the chip itself, but then you also create the shape to make sure that it's tuned properly for the application. And then the antenna carrier itself, you'll see on the market, it's typically you know, PET carrier. Uh, we also have it as a paper option. So it, just fundamentally, that's what you see here. Now, if you think of HF, it's very similar. It's a PET, it's a lumen antenna, and it has a chip on it. And once again, the, the uh, antenna shape would be dependent upon what chip that you put into the inlay? Right. So the antenna shape is, I want to compensate for the material I'm putting it on. You have a chip that provides a little performance you want to match it to. And then you want to make sure that in the environment with the type of reader system you're using that you can maximize the performance here to make sure it works properly. Now, we, now we mentioned some standards throughout this initial uh, um, slide set of slides. So the, the way the standards kind of work is you think there's a hierarchy of, uh, of how this works. So from a very high level, you have the global bodies, which you, you, I think a lot of you are familiar with the ISO standard, which sets it at a global level. Then you have regional uh, standards, ETSI, um, which is a frequency, European uh, telecommunication system integration. integration. So those set uh, the, the frequency standards for that region, just as you would here in the U.S., at a national level, we have the FCC. Canada has a different industry body. So the, the easiest way to, to validate this is when you take any of your electronic devices, look, turn them over, you'll see all of the common logos around it's FCC, it's FCC certified, right? And then you have industry-specific um, uh, bodies that create standards at the application level. So, so if you are the Department of Defense would have some potentially different standards than you would have in apparel than you would have in aviation. So there's a whole kind of hierarchy of high level, big picture, down to the application level. And all of these um, auto identification uh, capture technologies, you know, would fit into those application level. And the last slide before I hand it off to Jeannie, uh, the, the technology, how do you, the technology can always be complex when you first see it, if you're first exposed to it. Those of us who have been in the industry a long time, you know, they understand it very well, they understand the language. So there's a lot of industry bodies, industry alliances that are providing education services, much like uh, what we're doing here with this webinar to, that AIMS, uh, that we've, we're AIMS sharing, sponsoring. AIMS sponsoring. Um, education, you know, here are the standards and guidelines specific to the application, and then you have white papers, which give you use, you know, use cases and case studies. And then you have you know, subject matter experts of the various companies that are part of these bodies that, that you see listed here that, that can provide a lot of good technical information. Uh, there's a lot of um, focus on getting the uh, end user base, which would be retailers and CPG companies to be participate participate in this to provide their knowledge and expertise. And then there's different work groups which are meant to look at maybe the regional or application level of standards and how to you know, promote the technology, how to um, you know, educate. And it is very much cross-functional in that you will, have, you, know, you will have competitors sitting in these work groups to collaborate in a, in a manner to educate and, and show the value of these different technologies. So with that, I'm going to pause, and I'm going to hand it off to Jeannie, and she'll carry you through the rest of the presentation. Thank you, George. 
So um, that was a good good explanation of what the uh, industry alliances for the different wireless technologies um, are. And so now we're going to talk about specifically one of those industry alliances. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is RAIN RFID. Uh, RAIN RFID stands for, once again, for Radio Frequency Identification. The RAIN RFID is a, very, a global alliance that started about two years ago. It started in 2014, and it's promoting the universal adoption of UHF RFID. So once again, that's that UHF RFID in that frequency band, which is 902 to 928 here in the United States. RAIN recognizes the link between the actual um, air protocol and the air interface, and then what needs to be put around there to make that a usable thing to provide business intelligence and business information for different people. So as that, as George mentioned earlier, the RAIN RFID solutions are going to use a reader on a tagged item with an inlay to manage the data and then take action on that data. Uh, this is just a uh, slide, kind of a eye chart also, on all the different companies that are involved in the RAIN Alliance. Even though that the RAIN Alliance uh, just started two years ago, there's already over 80 companies involved in that. And I think part of the you know, interest is that is certainly the widespread interest and adoption of US, UHF RFID. Also, I think people are getting used to the idea of these industry alliances and recognize the value that they bring in standardizing and providing performance testing. So the goals of the RAIN RFID Industry Alliance are basically we're, we're here to evangelize RAIN RFID, to promote RAIN RFID and the use of UHF RFID. Uh, we want to promote in that educational sense, promote market solutions. You know, we work with the different members of the organization to discuss what solutions they implement and what information can be made publicly available to bring highlight to how UHF RFID is being used to solve different problems. Uh, they protect the RAIN RFID trademark and brand, uh, so they actually allocate the use of this little RAIN RFID cloud that you see down in your uh, lower screen corner. Uh, they're promoting the growth of their RFID industry, and they do uh, outreach. Uh, they, we do cross-industry events and RAIN RFID marketing events. So components of RAIN RFID, the, once again, this is going to look very similar. This is going to be a reoccurring theme that you see with RFID. You see the tagged items, and for RAIN RFID, you'll see that the tag is either placed on the outside of the item or it's integrated into the packaging or container of the item. And we work with people to do both solutions. Uh, the tag item is going to store information and send it. Thousands of items can be identified simultaneously depending on your reader setup, and they don't have to have line of sight visibility. One of the uh, advantages of RFID, whether if you're talking about UHF RFID or HF RFID, um, is the fact that you no longer require line of sight as you do to scan a barcode. Uh, the RAIN RFID readers have an antenna suited for their application, whether it's near field, which means it's very close in, or far field. Uh, your readers come in various sizes and shapes uh, suitable for the application. They can be on a shelf, they can be um, embedded in a printer, they can be on a forklift truck, they can be on a dock door. And then your RAIN RFID application software is used to identify identify and locate the item. They use to collect the information produced by the item locally, or now you see more very commonly this information is promoted to the cloud. Uh, they can authenticate the item and make sure that you're talking to the item that you want to be talking to. And more and more you're seeing RAIN RFID involved with various types of sensors to provide even more information, either about water, temperature, pressure, and different types of environmental impacts that can impact your data. This, this is just meant to be a graphic to kind of display this whole concept that we've been talking about. Down there at the bottom of your chart, you're seeing all the different items that can be tagged. And then your next level up is basically your 
application and your readers gathering that information from their items, and then we show the link to the cloud. So RAIN, what we talk about in RAIN RFID Alliance is that RAIN is enabling basically the Internet of Things. Uh, RAIN is connecting lots of different things. Uh, it's connecting to billions of items now worldwide. The adoption of RAIN RFID has become very high. Um, and it's used in multiple different industries. As we've been talking about today and George mentioned, it's used in makeup, it's used heavily in apparel, healthcare, food, pharmaceuticals, and location type of tracking. To give you an idea, in 2014, there was five billion things tracked. That by 2020, is supposed to be up to 25 billion things of connected to cloud-based information through these networks that we're talking about of the tag, the reader, the business application, and then promoting the information to the cloud. This gives you some forecasts of adoption. In 2015, about 60% of RAIN RFID was used in the apparel industry. This would be for uh, marking jeans, marking undergarments, marking outerwear. Shoes is a big item in apparel that's currently making use of RAIN RFID. But that uh, other applications are gaining more traction, and you're going to see RAIN RFID spreading out more to those other applications that we talked about on the previous slide, being food, medical, and other things. Um, this gives you an idea worldwide where it is in 2000, from 2015 to 2018, showing you where RFID is being used in Americas, Asia, and Europe. So as George mentioned earlier, in your industry alliances, you have different work groups. And so the industry alliance work group for RAIN, they, they center around marketing. So what we're trying to achieve in the marketing work group is to make people more familiar with RAIN RFID and what the capabilities of RAIN RFID are. Uh, in order to achieve those gains, uh, we hold uh, local regionalized meetings through cities across the country, across the world. Uh, there was recently a very well attended RAIN RFID meeting in Europe. And then a lot of times we will piggyback onto other industry alliance and organizations such as the RFIG Journal live event that's going to be coming up here early in May. Uh, there's a solution group that focuses on taking these different parts, whether it be the tag, the reader, the application, or how you promote the data to the cloud, um, and how do you put those together to meet and solve individual business needs. There's a development form that's available. It has sample code for different devices that are available in the industry. And there's a, a specific group in the RAIN RFID Alliance targeted at packaging and how you make packaging uh, smart. That's how you directly embed RFID chips into inlays into packaging. So RAIN RFID is enabling the Internet of everyday things. It's a very low-cost solution to identification and data collection. It, uh, primarily, RAIN RFID is used in the passive mode, even though George mentioned earlier in the three types of RFID, it's active, semi-active, and passive. But the good thing about a passive RFID is batteries do not last forever. We have no battery technology that we know of today that lasts forever, but in passive RFID, that information is pretty much there. It's going to be there 10 years from now. Um, there's a good read distance with uh, RAIN RFID. You're looking at 10 meter, uh, meters or more. Uh, there's a very fast read rate with RAIN RFID. You can read 1,000 tags per second depending on your reader technology that you're using. There are becoming more and more sensors integrated with RAIN RFID. Those are your temperature sensors, your humidity sensors, your different sensor technologies. And there's an encryption suite now available for RAIN RFID in order to secure the data. Uh, very similar, your encryption that's available is very similar to your Wi-Fi when you talk about um, 802.11i and it's secure access. There's also now encryption available for RAIN. 
up here on the slide, I have the website for the RAIN RFID, www.rainrfid.org. Um, if you're interested in joining RAIN RFID, the industry alliances are made up of subject matter um, experts, uh, universities, end user customers, and just people interested in the technology. So if you're interested in learning more about RAIN RFID, I encourage you to go up to the website. Uh, dues are based upon whether you're registering as a university, an individual, a large company, or how you're, uh, how you're registering. And you can also sign up for the latest uh, news bulletin that's sent out up on the RAIN RFID website. RFID Journal Live, at the upcoming RFID Journal Live in Orlando will be a great opportunity to learn more about the RAIN Industry Alliance. There's going to be a cocktail party Wednesday, um, Wednesday, May 4th. You need to get an invite from any of the RAIN member alliances. As I said, there's over 80 companies that are members of RAIN, so at the RFID Journal Live, it should be uh, fairly easy to get an invite to that event. And we encourage you to come and uh, talk to people if you're interested in the technology or if you have a problem that you believe can be solved by this technology. So now we're going to kind of switch uh, gears here. We're going to, we've been talking about the RAIN RFID. Now we're going to switch to talking to NFC. NFC is certainly something that everyone is hearing a lot about these days. Uh, NFC is uh, uh, facilitating many different applications. It's very fast, it's very easy to use, and there's also a very strong infrastructure, as we're going to discuss, and that's why you're hearing so much about NFC. Um, NFC is basically a protocol, it's the derivative of HF RFID, so that means you're going to see it operate at that frequency, air frequency range of 13.56. Uh, it has three primarily different use cases that uh, are used in the industry. We're going to talk about each one of those. Those are mainly peer-to-peer, -peer, card emulation, and tag reader operations. It enables very simple techniques and transactions. Um, it has a very secure ar architecture. It does have security built into the system, as we'll discuss. The other reason why it, um, NFC is very uh, secure is it's a proximity-based thing. Uh, NFC is a very close-range technology, and um, by the mere fact that you have to be close in in order to utilize the technology, you're given that physical presence security. Uh, there at the bottom is some um, numbers on 2015 for market share of different OSs supporting uh, the NFC technology. And here on the next slide is the NFC timeline. NFC was basically co-invented by NXP and Sony in the 2002. 2004, the NFC forum was um, established. So the NFC forum has been around now for about 12 years as an industry alliance. Uh, field trials started in the 2005-2006 time frame. Uh, the exciting thing in 2014 is Apple announced the introduction of NFC on their devices, making uh, NFC available on all mobile devices. And in 2018, 67% of new phones shipped are, um, will have an NFC reader writer installed in them. So that means it's going to be a huge infrastructure of reader writers that are available to interact with these NFC tags. The NFC forum, as I mentioned, uh, there is also an NFC forum. And the, and the goals of the NFC forum will really line up very well with the goals of the RAIN RFID forum. Um, it's basically to develop standard-based NFC, encourage the development of NFC, on different products to solve different solutions, to ensure that products claiming that they're NFC are compliant with each other, so you have that nice interoperability experience that everybody likes. They tried something and it works. And it's also an education uh, function to inform consumers and enterprises about what NFC is and how it can be used to solve problems for you. The NFC Alliance membership 
Um, as I said, this started in 2004, so it's been going on for about 12 years now. They have sponsor or founding type members there, and then they have principal members that are listed on the screen. And there's over 80 other companies in addition to these uh, foundational members that are members of the NFC Alliance. So the forum has basically four uh, functions that we've talked about. They promote technical specifications, special interest groups, which are especially to solve whether it's contactless payments, it's your smart posters, the different NFC type of applications have special interest groups to serve and answer questions specifically around that application. There's the compliance program to solve the interoperability and to ensure that there's interoperability between the different NFC devices. And there's membership where people can, uh, subject, you can meet with subject matter experts at different NFC forum trade shows or at different events. The NFC forum will have a booth where you can meet with industry experts and learn more about the technology. The interesting thing about the NFC forum as Joe, uh, George mentioned earlier, you have your international bodies, ISO, you have your um, regional bodies, your national bodies, and then the industry groups. Because the NFC Forum's been around for about 12 years now, they've also started developing their own set of specifications covering their different primary use groups, use cases. Uh, this uh, next slide's kind of an eye chart, I apologize for that. But it, the main point of this chart is to give you an idea of how NFC stacks up to other wireless technologies. A lot of people, times people don't think of RFID as um, wireless technologies, but they are. Similar to the way your cell phone works, to the way your wireless uh, tablet works, RFID, whether it's uh, RAIN RFID or NFC, is really just another wireless technology. Uh, NFC is a short range wireless technology. It's typically in the 10 centimeters or less. It operates at that 1356, and it operates within the globally available space. And that means that all of the different, just like the FCC uh, talked about the spectrum here in the United States, uh, the ETSI has a spectrum for NFC, Australia has a, a spectrum for NFC. So it is a globally operating standard. Uh, NFC devices are able to receive and transmit data at the same time, and it supports different rate data rates uh, from a very low to a little bit higher data rate. This next slide kind of gives you a better visual of how NFC stacks up against different wireless technologies. And you see, and we just were talking about the fact that NFC is a very close range technology. It's 10 centimeters or less. It's also a fairly slow wireless technology when compared to things like Wi-Fi or 3G um, or even Bluetooth. So that means the amount of data that you're going to see transmitted in an NFC technology is typically going to be less than what you might see. You're probably not going to be streaming a lot of video on NFC. The different NFC standards um, are there. You have the 18. Now these standards here are on a top of the 15693, but which is an air interface standard. These are your ISO interactive standards for the different use cases. This is a good slide. Um, it kind of really gets the point across very well. NFC is really like your USB drive or a cell phone where you can have a, a short, short conversation, you are exchanging data. Um, by 2018, there's going to be 1.7 billion NFC-enabled smartphones in the market. So here's the three primary operations of NFC. You have the NFC card emulation mode, um, the peer-to-peer -peer or reader-to-reader -reader type applications, and then your reader-writer mode, which is most similar to the RAIN RFID. So in your smart key, your host card emulation, you're going to see basically that's where your payment cards come into. That's where your um, your access cards on as, as a ticket, uh, your credit card applications, 
uh, those where you're going to see these types of application is in your host card emulation. This gives you a good graph of how the host card emulation works. Basically, we talked about NFC as being secure, and the way, partly the way it drives that security is both the device and the payment inside both communicate with the cloud to make sure that the identified party is authorized to make this transaction. So the advantages of NFC payments is, you know, it's very open loop, a closed loop. You can either have a very open payment like a Visa or you can have like a club card. Um, very tap to pay. It is secure because as we talked on the last slide, both sides are communicating and doing an authentication. Uh, you have a paperless receipt. You typically get an email receipt. And it facilitates loyalty programs and uh, coupons very well. Your tap to access is the same type of thing. It's a very secure type of thing um, because it's communicating on the side to make sure that you have that Genie Ducket is actually checked into this uh, building and has the ability to make these access requests. So it's a secure in that way and also secure in the proximity. Peer to peer. In a peer to peer, two uh, NFC devices exchange information by basically tapping together. Uh, your peer-to-peer -peer can actually be both passive communication and active. Your active peer-to-peer -peer is going to be like your Android B. Uh, two cell phones come within close proximity together, and they're, and they're able to uh, exchange data in that method. Uh, here's your examples of your peer-to-peer. -peer. You have your tapping. Uh, another peer-to-peer -peer example would be the wireless uh, printing that we now enjoy on our cell phone. Like on my HP printer, I can now print directly to that through NFC. Reader tag, the last application I want to talk about here is your reader tag. This is very similar to your uh, RAIN RFID application and the fact that you really have a, a reader acting as a host. Most likely that reader is still going to be in a, uh, in a smart device and then you have a tag that you're going to talk to, and that tag is going to be in that inlay structure with a chip, an antenna, and a, and a carrier. Uh, your uh, consumer engagements can be done with NFC tags. Your smart posters are going to be NFC tags. Uh, here's an ex some examples commercially available of tap to find. That would be an NFC tag reader or smart poster. The Nintendo 3DS offer also is offering a uh, reader the tag operation to make that game experience better for your kids and for everybody that likes to do gaming. Uh, the TT Sensor Plus is a product by Avery Dennison. It's also basically this reader tag concept. This is a concept where we are integrated a sensor, in this case a temperature sensor, and we store the data in the tag, and then when it comes in proximity of a reader, it will respond with what temperature that device has seen. That may be very good for uh, supply chain applications where you want to monitor the temperature that an item has gone through throughout the supply chain. NFC is a critical link for enabling the IoT. Um, similar to the RAIN RFID, you have that tag, then the application, the business application, you have a widespread, low-cost reader implementations on all the smartphones and tablets, and then you have the web or the cloud, um, cloud-based data. So RFID, we've been talking a lot about RFID today, whether it's been uh, the NFC or the RAIN RFID. And so just to recap a little bit, RFID is an old technology. It started back in the World War II, and it really came into prominence in the late 90s, early 2000s with the Auto ID Works to introduce RFID into the supply chain. There are those different frequencies, their LF that we talked about early on, and then really your HF at the 1356 is your NFC devices, and your UHF at the 960 to 950 is your RAIN RFID. And we really want to emphasize today that RFID is really fueling the Internet of everyday things. 
Uh, that's a brief discussion about Avery Dennison. Avery Dennison provides integrated solutions in RFID inlays, in reader devices, and also in those sensor type enabled devices that we talked about briefly. I would like to uh, recognize AIM Global. As Mary Lou said at the start of the uh, presentation, AIM Global is an industry alliance. The RAIN RFID uh, Alliance is actually now a subcommittee of the AIM Global International. And we are an unbiased uh, committee basically for networking and the promotion of technology in all AIDC, but especially also in uh, RAIN RFID and NFC. I would like to give special recogni uh, recognition in this presentation for all the materials. Uh, uh, Steve Halliday, president of AIM RAIN Alliance, uh, with the contact information there, provided a lot of the materials for the RAIN RFID. And Nigel Stott, the global account manager for NSC and RFID from NXP, uh, assisted by providing a lot of the information on the NFC technologies. And now we have a few minutes, uh, five minutes, that we have available if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask. Thank you, Jeannie and George. Um, it looks like we do have a few questions um, for our AIM webinar Q&A session. Um, so, folks, I do have a couple emails, excuse me, a couple um, chats already with some questions. If you have any questions, please send them um, to the AIM Inc. host. Um, Folks, the first question is, are there, is there a tag type you can read through very thin aluminum foil looking towards NFC type of tags? Uh, I, I guess in terms of reading through very thin foil, I mean, the foil itself will create a shielding effect. Uh, we have seen that depending on the, the thickness of the foil and sort of the specific application, application that, you know, the tags can work. If, if, so I guess, we, I guess the short answer is we would want to kind of assess in the application what does that look like. Uh, typically, if you have a label, material spacing between the antenna and the surface, that may be enough uh, to get you off of the metal. And the conductivity of the metal foil that you're applying it to um, may be impacting, but not significantly. Thank you. The next question, and please forgive me, a thousand tags a second read rate. What information is being read? Well, typically uh, in your RAIN RFID applications, the memory sizes are typically small. They're um, less than 2K bits, not bytes. And, but uh, most common application now is 96 bits. So what you're reading is like a license plate or an ID that's indexed into a database of the individual items. The next question is, RFID was unified in Gen 1 and Gen 2 standards. These protocols define many things like memory proto protocol, et cetera. What is RAIN adding and why is it necessary now? Many of our RFID solutions for years did not use RAIN. I don't think RAIN um, is not intending to modify standards like the 18,663 um, standard covering the UHF RFID. RAIN is intended to promote the use of RFID, UHF RFID, uh, to educate people and to apply do that industry interoperability testing and compliance testing that's very needed. Uh, similar to the NFC forum, uh, NFC is heavily based upon the HF RFID, but the NFC forum provides that education, that outreach, and the interaction to promote the data and the use of the technology. Has RFID replaced the barcode? I, uh, yeah, I think permanently the barcode and RFID are both going to have a use case, a viable use case. Um, barcodes are very good in a one-to-one -one type of application 
and it does provide the physical security that you're actually usually knowing which barcode you're scanning when. Has a very very low cost of implementation barcodes, especially barcodes integrated with packaging. Your RFID application is more of a one to many. It's more of a non line of sight. And with non line of sight, the advantage is is you don't have to physically orient the item that you're scanning. But the other thing is it's a little more difficult to identify exactly what item you're scanning. L L R P already exists. Why rate? Once again, I think um, RAIN is, was formed as an alliance of different companies interested in the promoting of UHF RFID as a collaborative promotional body for the use in RFID. At this point in time, RAIN has not gotten involved in generating standards, specific standards, such as the NFC Forum or the Wi-Fi Alliance, but RAIN right now today is a is an industry action group to promote the use of RFID. Just to add to that, Janie, if you think of, if you think of Wi-Fi, I don't think any of, any one of us are asking today. Hey, do you have a, when you walk into a Starbucks? Hey, do you have 802.11, whatever the latest standard is? No, they say, do you have Wi-Fi? So, the Gen 2 standard is a Gen 2 standard. It's the ISO um, ratified, so there's an ISO for that. So that's not changing. Uh, it's just a way, instead of saying UHF, Gen 2, RFID, UHF, it's we're using RAIN RFID. So it does simplify kind of what the technology is, but to help with that promotion of the ubiquitous of it using, uh, you know, for item internet of things. Right, and you went from 802.11 to uh, BG. A, um, so now we're up to N. To your point, most people don't realize what 802.11 standard they're necessarily using, or nor do they care as long right. as it's interoperable. Right. What is the relationship between RAIN and AIM? Do you want to handle that one, Mary Lou? Um, yes. Um, RAIN is an industry alliance. Um, it is formed under the AIM umbrella. AIM also has a number of other committees um, that active, actively work on various um, AIDC-related um, 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 technologies and applications. Um, RAIN, uh, you all had, had some questions earlier about standards. Um, many of the RAIN members are also AIM members, and collectively we work on various industry standards. Um, AIM is a direct um, link up through the ANSI and ISO um, chain for standards work. Thank you. Um, do you have another question? Um, what is the size of an NFC tag for a read range of 10 centimeters? Are there smaller NFC tags, and how or rather does it relate to the read range? Well, I think, I mean, the 10 centimeters, so the, so 10 centimeters, you're talking Four inches. Four inches. So it'll typically, yeah, four inches or less. So the, the NFC, the larger the coil, the more coupling energy you get. Uh, typically for the smaller ones, I'm thinking offhand what they might be. They're 20 millimeter diameter, right. smaller type tags. About right. 1024 bits. 1024 bits. So it, I don't have the exact calculation, but it's more about how many, um, much energy you're getting into the tag. So if you think of a, a credit card size, something that size might get you, you know, 10 centimeters, but you typically you're going to see much smaller, you know, 20 millimeter type diameters. And just and the other thing too is the tag and how it interacts with the product. There is a a frequency shift that occurs. So there are some tags that operate not at 13, you know, type 13 megahertz, but they're in a 14.1 megahertz because when you put on a product, it does shift a little bit. So um, so there is some dependency there, but typically I would say you're seeing the smaller round circular uh, 20 millimeter or less size tags in the market. Right, and but the, and the other thing that really depends on is as far as contents and size of the NSC data, um, there is some, as George uh, mentioned, especially if you're using passive RFID, the amount of energy that you energize the passive tag with is certainly an impact. But the other thing is just the amount of time. If you're writing uh, 5K bits versus 100K um, bits or 100 bits, 
there's a significant amount of difference in the time that it takes. We have another question about the difference between NFC and RFID and, and which, how does someone choose? You're going to choose based upon what your application is and what type of infrastructure that you want to live within. If today, um, it, ubiquitous in your smart tablets and your smartphones, you're going to find an NFC reader. So you're going to see a lot of NFC applications based upon that being consumer facing uh, due to the fact that your consumer is holding an NFC reader writer in their hand. Whereas your RAIN RFID applications, the infrastructure is not quite as so as ubiquitous. You're going to see a lot more RAIN RFID applications at this time being business to business where you're installing an infrastructure in that area. Beyond that, since they're at different frequencies and they have different read range, depends upon the application that you want to achieve. Yeah, I mean, typically what you would see is in a general supply chain application, so you're going to, you want to tag your items and read them from the point of source through your supply chain to the store, that that's typically going to be a RAIN RFID in that 900 megahertz band, frequency band, because you're getting long read ranges, a lot of versatility there. NFC, as Jeannie was talking about, when you start talking about consumer interaction, consumer experience, where they have the, the phone in their hand that can interact with the NFC, that's where you would see it coming into play you know, on a tag product. Okay. Um, I do have another question. Um, how do you see the future for the next 10 to 20 years of UHF RAIN RFID versus NFC? Well, since they're really addressing uh, two different use cases, I think the future for both technologies is very bright. I think you're going to see uh, adoption of RAIN RFID in business to business or controlled business to uh, user applications such as a doctor, office, or medical records. Um, and then certainly as more and more cell phones, by 2018, 70% of all the cell phones shipped are going to have an NFC reader writer in them. You're going to see a lot of consumer type facing applications uh, interacting with your cell phones. Right. So yeah, on our, and to that point, on the NFC side, you'll see it in its applications of that consumer experience. And it might be, you know, the consumer experience doesn't just have to be limited to the phone and the tag product. It could be like a uh, some of the video games where you have the figurines that you the put on the terminal, one. Nintendo, and turn on the terminal where you change those characters. So you're going to get different types of consumer experience, number one. And with RAIN RFID, as you start thinking about item level tagging and everything, um, you know, we'd expect to see more proliferation of that into applications outside of apparel and, and, and aviation, of course. And then you'll see a, maybe a bridging of those two together. Um, I mean, there are the technology today where NFC and UHF is, is can be integrated in, into one type of product. So I think they're mutually exclusive, but then they'll be they'll combine at, at different application points, and it'll really depend. Okay. Um, very good. That actually concludes our Q&A session. I want to thank all of our participants who submitted questions. I um, do want to let you know the audio recording and slide deck will be available to you all within one week. Um, we will actually email everyone um, with, the, um, with this information. I also would like to thank Jeannie and George um, for their insight and knowledge into the difference between NFC, UHF, and RAIN RFID, and for providing us this presentation today. I also would like to thank the audience for their active participation. I hope you all found this information to be valuable and we would appreciate your feedback. So please take the time to complete a brief session evaluation, which will be emailed to you shortly. This information will be used to develop um, future um, presentations in our AIM webinar series. Thank you so much, and have a great day.